the normal distribution. The bell curve, uh, the Gaussian distribution, is fundamental. It describes effects of many small variations about a mean, but only if those variations are independent, random, and average to zero. So we're going to take as an example a farmer who's planted a flat field with corn. He expects all the corn plants to be about the same height when he harvests them. And they certainly look the same height in this uh, photograph. Let's let mu denote that average uh, or expected average height. So all the corn on average has height mu. But of course, if I was to choose one of these corn plants at random, its height very likely differs at least a small, slight amount from mu. So each plant here is a trial. There's thousands or even millions of small random variations from one plant to the next. Some plants have slightly better soil. The plants get different amounts of water. Clouds shade at one area of a field more on one day than on another. And if all these plants are far enough apart, we can assume that each plant is an independent trial. Of course, they intentionally plant the corn so they're independent, so they can all grow independent of each other. Now, few if any plants have height mu, because each varies from the expected height due to the accumulation of all these very small variations, but there are a huge number of these small variations, and if you look closely, you can see there are different heights to the corn, but only slightly different heights. So let x sub i be the height of the ith corn plant. Then epsilon sub i j will be the jth deviation or difference for the ith plant. So epsilon sub j1, for instance, could be how much soil quality caused the ith plant to deviate from the average mu. Epsilon sub i2 for all the i plants could be how much the water availability at planting caused the ith plant to deviate from mu. i3, how much water availability close to harvest caused the ith plant to deviate from mu. You can see here huge number of possible sources of these small variations. Now we can't measure all these individual deviations, but we can measure their overall average impact. Suppose there are n corn plants and m possible deviations. These are both very large numbers. Epsilon sub i j is a random variable uh, for i equals 1 to n and j equals 1 to m. Each i epsilon sub i j is independent of all the other deviations. So if x sub i is the height of the ith corn plant, then x1 is mu plus epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon sub 1 2 all the way up to epsilon sub 1 n. x2, likewise mu plus epsilon 2 1 plus epsilon 2 2 all the way up to epsilon sub 2 m. All the way down to x sub n b mu plus epsilon sub n 1 plus epsilon sub n 2 all the way up to epsilon sub n m. So the average of the x sub i is, is mu. Now, remember this sigma here means add, and it's used for convenience. It's not mysterious, and you should never make it mysterious. When in doubt, write it out. So if I write i equals 0 to 4 of 2 to the j, that's just for convenience. If it doesn't look right to you, or you don't understand exactly what it's trying to say, then just write it all out. So that's i equals 1 to 4, 2 to the i, so what does that mean? That's for i equals 0, you get a term. And for i equals 1, you get a term. For i equals 2, you get a term. And 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1st plus 2 to the 2nd plus 2 to the 3rd plus 2 to the 4th is 31. So when we average, we're just summing up all the x sub i's and dividing by the number of them, which is n. Now that means that the sum of all the epsilon sub i j's has to be 0. Now what does that mean? Well, the average value of the epsilon sub i j's is zero. Some of the deviations therefore are positive and some are negative, and some may actually be zero. Now if r sub i is the sum j equals 1 to m of epsilon sub i j, if that's the total deviation for the ith plant, then it has to sum up to be zero. So in other words, its average value has to be zero. Why? because we're adding up epsilon sub i j's that are all independent small variations, some negative, some positive. 
Likewise, the R sub i's, some will be positive, some negative, and some may be zero. And the R sub i's are what are called the residuals for the plant heights. Now, most of these residuals are close to zero. Why? Because we, our R sub i's are the sums of things that are positive and negative, and, and these are all small variations, so that all these small positive and negatives tend to cancel each other out. Now, we're only going to allow epsilon sub i j close to zero. So differences in soil quality can't cause a corn plant to triple in height, for instance. So notice that you know, we couldn't accidentally dump the fertilizer and lo and behold we've got one corn plant that's 25 feet tall. That would be an epsilon sub i j impact that's not close to zero. So you look at this field, all the epsilon sub i j's must be close to zero. So the epsilon sub i j's are independent, we've already talked about that. Notice these are assumptions however the independence really means that each plant gets the same amount of water, sunlight, nutrients, and everything they would get, even if it was the only plant in the field. And it's easy to violate this assumption of independence. For instance, if you plant the plants too close together, one will be underneath the other and won't get as much sunlight. So the assumption of independence really requires that somebody made things independent. So we get R sub i is epsilon sub i1 plus epsilon sub i2 all the way up to epsilon sub i m, and lots of cancellation is in there. So sums of large subsets of epsilon sub i j are close to zero. Sums of large subsets of R sub i are close to zero. Negative R sub i is just as likely as positive R sub i, symmetry about zero. And so if we start looking at a histogram, so a bar chart where each bar represents the number of times that R sub i took a value on the x-axis. So the bar will be the number of trials where a is less than or equal to R sub i less than or equal to b. And notice that the negative R sub i is just like his positive R sub i. Most of the R sub i are close to zero. And we get this distribution. And it turns out that this curve is what's known as the Gaussian distribution. So let's look at it in a different way. Let's divide by the total number of trials and the counts over the totals will now be percents or frequencies. Now the area of rec each rectangle is the percentage of trials in which R sub i was between A and B. And once again we'll get the same curve because all we've done is rescaled the y-axis. And what is this curve? Well, it's a curve that corresponds to a variable r. r is a variable whose value is the deviation from mu of a corn plant chosen from random. And little r is the possible values of that capital R variable. So if each corn plant's height is independent of every other, if the random effects are always small, then the blue curve that we see here that's modeling the histogram is 1 over sigma the square root of 2 pi e to the negative r squared over the quantity 2 sigma squared. Where sigma here is the standard deviation of capital R. So if we have errors uh, of the form r sub j equals x sub i minus mu, then the average of the errors is 0 because the average of the x sub i is mu. And Therefore, in general, if we have a random variable x with mean mu and standard deviation sigma normally distributed, then instead of the r squared, we get the x minus mu squared. And that's really the only difference between this and the previous slide. So it's just the bell curve shifted over. The distance from the mean to an inflection point is the standard deviation. And this is our Gaussian curve and the Gaussian distribution is the probability distribution that you get and notice we used bars and since we used bars uh, the curve approximation that that is an integral so uh, the probability that we get something between a and b is 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi a to b e to the negative quantity 
x minus mu squared over the quantity 2 sigma squared dx. This leads to what's called the central limit theorem. As the samples from a population become larger, estimates of the average for the population become more accurate. So if we had 12 corn plants, we wouldn't get a good measure of mu. But as the number of corn plants grows close to the number of plants in the field, we get better and better estimates of mu because we get more and more cancellation of the small deviations. This is what's known as the central limit theorem. As n becomes large, the sample average approaches the population average. The variance, which is the square of the standard deviation, goes to zero. So a sample of n corn plants has about the same average as the population. The larger the n, the more accurately the sample estimates the actual population average mu for the entire field. So a sub n is a random variable representing the average over a random sample of size n. And sigma of a sub n, the standard deviation of that, is the standard deviation of an individual trial divided by the square root of n. So what happens is n goes to infinity, uh, the sigma a sub n goes to zero. And the a sub n is a good estimate then of the mu. This is our standard normal distribution. And just repeating what we've already said about the uh, probability distribution is the integral. So the curve itself is called the density. What gives you probabilities is a distribution. So this area here is the distribution uh, that is given to us by the density curve, which is the bell curve that's given by the exponential. So if R has a standard normal distribution, and the area under the region of the bell curve that's over AB is the probability that R is an AB. So for instance, the probability that R is negative, given this standard normal distribution, is a half. And the probability that R is a number between negative infinity and positive infinity is 1, because R is a number. So for example, if you're doing linear regression, if you've got a data set that can be modeled by a straight line, then x and y here are variables, and m and b are model parameters, and our model is y sub i, the data point, uh, is equal to m, the parameter, times x sub i, the data point, plus b, plus r sub i. And the r sub i are the residuals, causing it to not be exactly on the line whose uh, equations given by y equals mx plus b. So y sub i is mxi plus b plus r sub i, where r sub i is the residual. And the r sub i are independent random values of a residual variable r. Gauss showed if r has a normal distribution, the line is the best fit model for the data. What do we mean by that? Recall the area is the percentage of the r sub i is between a and b, the area of a bar over a and b. So if we get the residuals having a Gaussian distribution-like uh, histogram, then the line is the best model. But you've got to be careful. Normal distributions are very important, but they're not all important. Assumptions are often violated, especially in multi-scale big data. So let's look at an example. One of the most common examples of a normal distribution is human height. So are human heights independent? Uh, no, they're not. In fact, between the 1870s and 1970s, European men's height increased by about one centimeter per decade. So if you had a sample of males then that included both sons and fathers, then they're, they're not independent. So the height of the son is going to be dependent on the height of the father, according to this uh, study. Height also varies between socioeconomic classes. So the complex structure of society plays a role in determining how tall a child is. We can actually see the impact of that. So females ages 18 to 74 in the United States have a mean height of 63 and a half inches with a standard deviation of two and a half inches. So that means the probability that an American woman, chosen at random, being more than 76 inches tall, 6 foot 4, is 
point zero 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 two eight seven. That's a really small probability. That means that of the 161 or so million women in the United States, we would only expect 46 of them to be 6 feet 4 inches tall. And we would expect, if we expand this to the entire human population of the entire Earth, then we would expect no woman in the world to be more than 6 feet 6 and a half inches. The WNBA alone, however, has 10 Americans that are 6'5 or taller. And there are two players in the WNBA that are 6'8 or taller. So what does that mean? Well, often this is referred to as a black swan, uh, a game changer, uh, which kind of fits this example. And the problem is that normal distributions tend to only be valid in the vicinity or scale of the average. So at the average, we're looking at millions upon millions of women. But once we get out to the extremes, we're, only, we're trying to actually say something probabilistically when we only have tens or at most hundreds of uh, actual uh, instances. So in summary, uh, a normal distribution of each trial of an experiment depends on a, a large number of small random effects. And if those small random effects are independent, for example, plants faced far enough apart, uh, crowding that uh, would cause competition, and therefore you'd have winners and losers. So, therefore, you would not have independence if the plants were crowded together. Just walk through the woods and see who the winners or losers are in terms of the trees, those that formed the canopy and those puny ones that didn't quite get up there. So small random effects have to always be small. So we can't have any uh, super trees or super corn plants because of some big fertilizer dump or something. In that case, the histogram of the trial outcomes is normally distributed or bell-shaped. But very important, notice, if large numbers of small random effects, if independence, if random effects are always small, then we get the normal distribution. So normal distributions are very, very important, but they're not all-encompassing. You can't explain everything with a normal distribution. In fact, I want to look at a postscript. We look at big data, and a lot of times people think big in terms of large, how much data there is. But the central limit theorem implies that a sample mean predicts a population mean. This is the basis for polling. We ask a few and that predicts the many. We sample a few thousand to predict the voting patterns of millions. If data is just large, then we don't need to use all the data. We can just sample it and apply the central limit theorem. However, if sampling in the central limit theorem is not sufficient, which is very often the case with big data, Data has something to it beyond just being large. In fact, big data is not just large, it's complex. So complex that it violates what we need in order to apply the Gaussian in many, many instances.